You always do. Is it just me? All right, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Sarah Bexell, and um, I work for the Institute for Human-Animal Connection at the University of Denver, as well as for the Chengdu Research Base of Giant Panda Breeding. Um, this has been a really exciting conference. Um, at the Institute where I work, we study and, and practice and teach in all realms of human-animal interactions, so I am super excited to bring back all of my new knowledge that I've gained from all of you in the room back to our students and to all of my colleagues. So thank you, um, Ron, Scott, and Stephanie for inviting me to do this. Um, we're going to switch the conversation that we just completed um, with all of our colleagues from the zoo world to folks that, that are not um, working in the zoo world to ask the exact same question. Do zoos and aquariums have animal welfare as a foundation? Um, first speaking will be Dr. David Frazier, um, Professor of Animal Welfare at the University of British Columbia, and Dr. Mark Beckoff. Um, you've all heard from Mark already, but um, Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and Wayne Paselli, President and CEO of the Humane Society of the United States. David, do you want to get us started? Okay. Uh, sound at the back. Sound at the back now. Great. Thank you. Um, I think in order to answer that question, we need to sort out something that came up yesterday where I heard three very different conceptions of what animal welfare is. And the answer to the question is going to depend on which of those we opt for. So I don't know if you followed, but I heard uh, Jake Vesey and others say animal welfare is all about the subjective well-being of the animal. Is it happy and content as opposed to distressed and suffering? So the affective state of the animal uh, ranging from, from, from happy to unhappy. But, says, says another hy hypothetical objection, suppose we have a monkey in a cage intubated to feel uh, a chemical happiness in perpetuity, but it doesn't do anything. Well, says the objector, this isn't, the animal is happy, but this isn't welfare because the animal can't be a monkey. It can't develop its, its agency, autonomy, its, its, its cognitive abilities. It can't perform its natural behavior. That's the essence of animal welfare. And then, uh, to pull in a veterinarian in, in my past, uh, just come in from treating foot rot in a flock of sheep in a, in a uh, wet pasture where there are coyotes. Uh, to this person, nature is not the answer. Nature is the problem. The fundamental for animal welfare is that the animal is healthy and functioning well and safe. So all through the literature on animal welfare, as people have spilled gallons of ink trying to define the term, we see that when people express concerns about animal welfare, they tend to mean those three things in different degrees. Madam Chair, if we could, I think we can actually answer the question of which one is right with a little show of hands. Okay, so let's do this. I'm going to, let's have four choices instead of three. First of all, if you believe that animal welfare is fundamentally about the subjective well-being of the animal, vote affective states. If you believe it is fundamentally about the naturalness, including agency, autonomy, natural behavior, natural development, vote naturalness. If you believe that it is fundamentally about the basic health and functioning of the animals, vote health and functioning, and if you're conflicted, vote conflicted. <laughs> are we ready? How many are going for affective states? Please look around to appreciate the, the responses. How many are going for naturalness? How many are going for health and functioning? How many are conflicted? Yeah. So uh, I, I've asked this question numerous times, 
the answer is always. The, the ratios change depending on whether it's a veterinary audience, a group of humanities scholars, uh, organic farmers, and so on. But the, the, the majority tend to be conflicted. What this tells us is that these are not simply debates between different demographic sectors. They're actually debates so rooted in our culture that they are, are acting themselves out in our own minds. We ourselves have trouble deciding one or the other. And I think the practical point is that in order for practices and policies to be seen as genuinely supporting animal welfare, they have to strike a balance among those three. So the answer, my answer to the question today is that uh, probably most good zoos do have animal welfare as a foundation, but they may take one or other or a rather narrow view of animal welfare and are not seen as being uh, supporting animal welfare by others who take a different view. Um, is this on? Yeah. I'm not really sure what to say. <laughs> Wayne is ready. I'm ready for Okay, you go. Yeah. I have a few notes that I want to hear. Okay, from. Yeah. all right. Well, thank you, Ron. Thanks for convening all of us. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for uh, allowing me to be on the panel. This is obviously about animal welfare perspectives on the zoo and aquarium industry. It's not a self-reflective issue about the problems <laughs> within the animal welfare camp. There are certainly big debates and big discussions that exist within that domain, and uh, that is also a, a subject for a future conference, I'm sure. But um, uh, we're supposed to, to offer some insights into how this industry is doing, and uh, I, I really believe that, that things are evolving. Um, you know, one of these uh, principles, Kaizen, of continuous improvement in the workplace is obviously a principle that I think all of us abide by and all the things that we do. We've got to continuously improve. And it means obviously taking a, a very critical look at how we're operating as individuals and institutions and as a broader industry and, and sector. You know, we, we within the animal welfare community deal with a wide range of issues. I tell people that the question of our human relationship with animals is just hugely complex. It draws us into the realms of many sciences, biological sciences and other sciences, into the issues of sociology and law and politics and criminal justice and so many other domains. And I think that, that the zoo and aquarium world is obviously dealing with just this wide range of issues, different metrics, and I think that this is the opportunity and it's the curse of, of what th this industry is doing. You've got to keep your eye on many balls at the same time. And I think that one of the big problems that I've seen with many industries where animals have been used is that there was one or two metrics that were the focus of the industry and some of these other very important value-based metrics were subordinated. You know, if you look at the issue of factory farming, there's nothing wrong with efficiency, which is what drove the concentration of agriculture, the confinement of animals, the mass production of animals. Efficiency is a great notion. We should be efficient. It's only a problem when you subordinate animal welfare. And I think that you know the polarity here has been kind of attendance and entertainment and then animal welfare. And you know from what I'm hearing at this conference, obviously the concern about animal welfare has been elevated dramatically. It's going to continue to be elevated dramatically, and that's as it should be. If animals are at the center of the enterprise, they should be at the center of our moral thinking as well. They're the ones that are drawing the people in. And to have credibility on these issues, we've got to be the foremost advocates for them. So I, I think that there's a process here, there's continuous improvement, I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, you know, there's too little leadership, as I've mentioned to, to Ron and our many discussions about a wide range of issues, there's too little leadership in so many different 
sectors of our society, whether it's in politics or it's in all the different realms that we live in and work in. I've seen some great examples of leadership. You know, Don Moore was very active with a ballot measure with the Portland Zoo to stop wildlife trafficking in Oregon. He was an open advocate on these issues. Ron Kagan on a very tough issue here in Michigan over the trophy hunting and commercial trapping of wolves stood out as an institution that gets private funds but also gets public funds. And in the state that has, I think, you know, nearly a million hunters spoke up and said that we shouldn't be killing these wolves for trophies because, you know, we've got all this rhetoric about, and it's, it's the right rhetoric, about wolves being a keystone species. They're critical for the ecology. They're a contributor to the economy. They balance ecosystems. They do so many things. Ron de decided he wasn't going to be on the sidelines. He was going to get some slings and arrows, but he was right in the center of that debate, which is where a major zoo in the state of Michigan should be on a question like that. You know, Ed uh, of PAWS mentioned that Joel Parrott was in the, in the center of the discussion about the use of bull hooks. Uh, Steve Ross spoke. He was a huge leader on the issue to protect chimpanzees and to upgrade protections for them that basically catalyzed the process of getting uh, chimpanzees out of, out of invasive experiments in laboratories. And <clears throat> Joel Manby's here from SeaWorld. And Joel and I, you know, Joel is a relatively new um, person at SeaWorld. And when he and I started talking through a mutual friend, um, you know, I, I didn't expect that the discussion was going to go anywhere. Obviously, the orcas were at the center of the thinking for him and his company because of blackfish. And, you know, that's part of this, this wide range of issues in our society is documentaries and media and how they frame the work. But when we started discussing things, I said to Joel, I didn't think that it was appropriate just to deal with the orca issues. I thought we needed to deal with a wider set of animal issues. He's got 25 or 30 orcas, very substantial welfare issue, a big issue. But SeaWorld has 20 million visitors. They're eating food when they go to the to the, to the SeaWorld parks. So you talk about animal welfare, what about the animals in the supply chain? Millions of animals every year served up to people. I mean, I think animal welfare in the broadest sense is about the food that we're thinking about in our society. So when we talked, I said, please, you've got to think about advocacy on shark finning and commercial whaling. You've got to think about your internal food policies. These are all parts of the animal welfare issue. I know I've just about run out of time, but I want to, I want to say that, that um, you know, there are so many, so many intersections of interest for us. You know, as we succeed as an animal welfare movement in getting animals out of situations of crisis and distress, including for captive wildlife, we're going to have all of these refugee animals. You know, there are 130 Big cat sanctuaries, Bill Nemo's here who's been supporting a lot of them. 130, it's millions and millions of dollars of liability that animal welfare groups deal with, not because they contributed to the problem in any way. We've been advocating for policies to prevent animals from getting into these terrible circumstances, whether roadside zoos or private ownership of animals. But we're dealing with it, and obviously the zoo community has been helping with that problem in very important ways, but we need your help now more than ever, as more and more animals come out of circuses, out of private homes, out of their basements and backyards, out of the exotic animal industry and trade in this country, and what an opportunity. Think of all the people who go to sanctuaries and rescue groups and the millions and millions of people who support them. And then think of all the tens of millions of people, of course, who go to zoos. If you blend these purposes, if you can entertain people and do the right thing, what a double bottom line benefit. What a double opportunity for us. And I think that, you know, we need leadership on these issues. And I, I guess I, I just want to, want to conclude by saying we are really ready to work with people uh, in the zoo and aquarium industry to solve problems. Uh, we've got to be the leaders, these two communities. And it's no time for, for bystanders. We've got to be able to take risks. 
We've got to be able to take some criticism, uh, and we've got to look at this wide range of social problems that exist that we can provide solutions to address. Before Mark gets started, I just wanted to mention, remember to be writing out your questions and getting those down for us. And I also really made a big mistake, and I forgot to send apologies from Dr. Paul Waldo, who could not be here today. He uh, has an injury and could not make it, so, but he sends his regards. <laughs> Mark, it's all you. Yeah. Hmm. Two hard acts to follow. Um, yeah, so I'm going to come back. I'll make an observation. So I think Wayne is right, and definitely when I, when I gave my talk yesterday, while I don't particularly find the education issue about zoos to be much debatable, I don't think they do much in terms of meaningful education. I think the conservation card is a really more difficult one um, to nuance, but I think it's worth mentioning that the new head of the AZA opened up national wildlife refuges to hunting and fishing. And what is a refuge other than a place where animals seek at least they seek safety, okay? I mean, they're going, things are going to happen, but I just want to mention that. So it's not clear across the board that everybody involved um, works on behalf of um, animals. So as a field biologist, I think about welfare, um, and I think I mentioned yesterday, I think that welfare fails animals because it doesn't really focus on individuals per se, which is why Jessica Pierce and I put forth the animal, the science of animal well-being. So right now we can blend the two, that's fine. But as a field biologist, I wonder about sort of an evolutionary perspective on welfare slash well-being for now. Okay, um, sure, life is tough in the wild. You hear that all the time. And that quote that I gave you yesterday saying, basically, you know, cutting through the chase, saying that, you know, well, life in the wild is, is hard, life in captivity is easy, implying that captive animals just have it made, if you will, which is, which is just such a false picture of who they really are, um, no matter whether you take a welfareist or well-being perspective. So, so the problem I have um, comes back to... Um, Killing otherwise healthy individuals like Marius, I, I'm glad Scott is very open of, um, you know, about his views. I mean, I know a lot of Danes who were offended beyond belief by that kind of um, activity, okay? And I know philosophers have pondered these questions on and off, whether death is a harm, is, you know, is death a welfare issue? Um, I'd like to believe that my death is a welfare issue for me. I I'd like to believe that it's a harm, although I suppose what we know about death, once we're gone, we're gone. But I, but I raise that also because I think that Doug raised a very big issue, um, and I had so many emails. I wrote a lot about Marius. I was offended by it. I was also offended by the same zoo killing four lions later on. I mean, just like... Well, yeah, let's just toss them out, make room for more lions who may be killed in the future because maybe they'll be making more baby lions who'll be killed in the future. And I had lots of emails from people, and I think it was just a complete media. Um, it was a disaster. And I know people who would be more pro-zoo, perhaps, than I would be, who were also really offended by this. They had no idea that these kinds of um, activities occurred within zoos. So taking a more natural, if you will, wild naturalistic view um, of well-being, um, life is tough out there. But is a wolf who, I mean, and I, I know a lot of you have heard these before, but I think it's important to revisit and within the framework of we um, welfare and well-being. Is a wolf who can't hunt really a wolf? Part of being an ungulate, a prey animal, is you've evolved certain skills, motor skills, sensory skills, as anti-predatory mechanisms. So it sounds ludicrous, but is, is, is a deer in captivity or an ungulate or a prey animal in captivity happy, content? Are they really a deer or an antelope by not being exposed to the conditions under which they evolved? 
And I think this is really important because we can make life cushy for everybody, can't we? I mean, we could just, we could just pull all animals into captivity and feed them and give them veterinary care. Um, as a field biologist, I've seen countless predatory acts by coyotes and wolves. And I never, people said, well, would you interfere in them? What about the well-being or the welfare of the prey animal? No, we never interfered. We couldn't, we couldn't send them to Whole Foods to, um, uh, you know, get a meal. We saw lots of fights. Um, some were, the majority weren't very injurious, but a lot were. Did we ever break up a fight? No. So what I'm returning to would be a view of welfare slash well-being from a more evolutionary point of view, accepting the fact that life is tough, but maybe that's just the way things have evolved. And maybe over the next certain number of years, there'll be different forces in se of selection and evolution that will result in a kind of world. I'll end off saying something that a lot of people don't know, that all the research that's been recently done on carnivores and primates shows, in fact, that more than 90% of their behavior in the wild is cooperative and is, if you will, friendly. This doesn't mean they don't fight, but it's actually fighting and injurious activities are incredibly rare compared to more cooperative or what people call pro-social um, or positive sorts of interactions. So, so far we have one question, so I hope you'll keep them coming. And this is a really great one, I think. Uh, and maybe what we could do is go one by one. Um, and the question is, if you could change one thing about zoos and aquariums, I assume that's the question, other than closing, <laughs> what is something really sort of proactive and, and new that maybe we could think about that, that we could all work towards creating that positive change? Okay, here's, what I, here, here's my suggestion. And I have to introduce another classification. We've heard a lot about accredited zoos being good and unaccredited zoos being bad. My experience is that there is a wide range within accredited zoos, and I want to do a little taxonomy here between walking the walk, talking the talk, and intermediate. Uh, I think Detroit does de, Detroit. I'm Canadian. I think I, I, I think Detroit does uh, actually walks the walk. So you see the amount of investment and staff time going into their animal welfare group, the humane education stuff, which I think is wonderful. Uh, doing kinds of humane education that nobody else is doing, other sectors in society are not doing. Um, so this, is th this, to my mind, is walking the walk. In contrast, another accredited institution, uh, in fact, I had three different institutions approach me at different times wanting animal welfare research projects at their institution. And these requests came sort of out of the blue and unbidden and on investigating a little further, I discovered, they were either in a position of facing negative publicity or were actually being investigated for cruelty and wanted to be able to talk about animal welfare stuff that they were doing in order to deflect problems. So that's talking the talk without walking the walk. Then there's an intermediate category where they actually are doing things but they are making so much public relations out of it that it is completely disproportionate to the level of investment. So, yes, doing wildlife rescue, but emphasizing this so much that it makes it look as though it's a major activity when it's actually extremely minor. So this is walking the walk, but turning it into a parade with a big band. <laughs> so my suggestion is, get the zoos, the accredited zoos, that are only talking the talk to start walking the walk, and the intermediate group to tone down the band. Oh, the one thing. That's a, those are always difficult questions. 
um, I would stop captive breeding. Thank you. That's good. Very good. I mean, quick. <laughs> yes. So I, I would say advocacy, that zoos should be crusading on animal issues, that they should be part of the animal protection movement. They should be speaking out on the big issues of the day, food and agriculture, environmental protection, climate change, species conservation, animal cruelty. You got animals. You got every kind of animal that's represented in the zoological community. You should be advocates of them all. So the question is, does HSUS advocate for zoos moving toward a sanctuary model? That, I thought it was going to be a really hard question. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, I, I think that you know, we, when you look at the entire animal welfare community, there are 25,000 or so animal welfare groups. There are 3,500 brick and mortar shelters. There are hundreds of big cat sanctuaries and bear sanctuaries. And I consider this all a huge unfunded mandate on the animal welfare community. You know, we spend a couple of billion dollars a year cleaning up other people's messes. And we are working to prevent these problems. We know we can't rescue our way out of these problems. And we're trying to kind of deal with animals in crisis, but at the same time, stop the flow of animals getting into bad situations. We see animals coming out of our ears all the time. You know, there are bears who are in trouble, and there are tigers in trouble, and I mean, I, as I said, I think that the model of entertaining people and giving them conservation education and, and exciting experiences at zoos combined with showing off rescue and showing off animal welfare, that's the best of both worlds. I don't know why it has to be one and not the other. So if you can populate your exhibits entirely with rescue animals, you should because you're, you're helping society, you're telling a great story, and you're populating your exhibits. And I, I really don't think that there's a lot, you know, I, I, I think I agree with, with uh, my colleagues on the panel that the actual species conservation work that's done at zoos in terms of saving species and getting them released in the wild is very, very, very limited. Now, if you're supporting field projects, you know, in Asia or Africa, that's a different matter. But I, I think that the animals on exhibit should be rescues if you possibly can, can do so. And this, I think, uh, dovetails nicely, and this one is for Mark. Um, if captive breeding is stopped, doesn't this end zoos ultimately? No. Well, Yes and no. I mean, if, if the captive breeding is stopped, there'd be, I mean, maybe this is a simplistic view, but then there'd be room for the rescued animals about whom Wayne is talking. So no, not necessarily um, at all. I mean, I, I'm a very, very, I don't think zoos are going to close anytime soon. I mean, I'm a realist that way, but I do think that if there's a way to make room for animals who are rescued, and in need of a home, then um, that would be one way to sort of op to, to open up. Um, one, one, issue, one issue that comes up, and I've heard it at this conference, and I've heard it from, from uh, folks within the industry, friends of mine in the industry, is that limiting breeding is an animal welfare issue, that the animal um, is lesser and his or her life experience is diminished because of no breeding. I mean, I, I think that that is counterintuitive to the average person um, in the United States where we live with spayed and neutered dogs and cats. And no one is really screaming that much. I mean, you get occasional views out there about dogs and cats not being able to breed. But for, for this argument to be made, and I know it's a widely held view, I, I think it, it rings a false note with, with the average uh, the average person, and it seems like an invoking of animal welfare when 
it, it's almost a disproportionate invoking of animal welfare that there are other much more paramount and obvious and evident animal welfare issues that we should be addressing. Yeah, so, but that really feeds in with, okay, so, the, I mean, people talk about birthrights and the right to have big babies, right? The right to be a mother, the right to be a father. Well, th doesn't a wolf have the right to hunt? I mean, they've evolved all these behavioral, anatomical, physiological adaptations to be predators, right? And so the flip side, of course, is not so pretty. Not that it's so pretty being a predator out there, but um, would be, like I said, the prey animal. And that's why I really like an evolutionary approach to it, you know? I mean, I've heard those stories. Well, it's natural for them to want to make babies. Well, it's natural for a wolf to want to hunt. It's natural for a deer to have, ev to have the fear of certain stimuli or something. So I think that argument about breeding goes both, can, you know, can cut both ways. Um, okay, at the back. Okay. I, I think we're on the wrong track here. Uh, we're talking about animal welfare debates about how zoos affect the animals who live there. And this is a very, very small number of the animals in the world. So by all means, uh, let us have these debates but not emphasize them. I want to come back to, to, to Carl's point in his, his talk after lunch, that if zoos can perform the service of alerting the public to the problems in, in the rest of the world relating to animals and conservation, can electrify children to be concerned about these things in ways that probably only zoos can achieve. To my mind, these are the really big animal welfare issues of zoos rather than captive breeding or not uh, killing surplus animals or not. The, uh, by all means, have these discussions within the community. But I think the, th there are bigger picture issues that zoos need to focus on. So, yeah, we, we are out of time. Um, but I would encourage everybody, not, we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but I, I think that Wayne and David and Mark will be around for a while. So thank you, everyone. Pues fácil, que le dicen bien.